My name is Stephen Jones, a physicist. I received my uh, PhD in physics from Vanderbilt University in 1978, so I've been at this for over 30 years, studying various uh, subjects. Uh, I like to study those things that are of, have an impact on society wherever I can, such as fusion energy. That's been my bread and butter for many years. Uh, in fact, I uh, began that probably in about 1979, my research into fusion, uh, various kinds of fusion, starting with hot fusion, then muon catalyzed fusion, metal catalyzed fusion. And I'm still very interested in alternative uh, energy methods. I've published papers in Scientific American, which was a paper about muon catalyzed fusion. I've published papers in Nature, a British publication, and uh, several papers there. I published in Physical Review Letters. And so I have some awareness of the importance of peer review. And uh, I can say, in all honesty, that my first paper on 9-11 research uh, met with considerable flack. And it was reviewed, uh, peer reviewed, uh, very heavily, actually. And um, before uh, publication, it was, uh, it was thoroughly peer-reviewed. Uh, one of those peer reviews happened when I spoke at the Utah Academy of, of Sciences, Arts, and Letters in uh, be April of 2007. I have published over 50 peer-reviewed papers in my career. Now, <clears throat> with regard to 9-11 research, uh, this began for me in the spring of 2005 when I heard a, a speaker saying that, uh, based on her analysis, she said, she made this rather bold statement to a large group of people. She, she was speaking about something entirely different, but she paused and she said, now if you think that those World Trade Center towers came down just because they were hit by airplanes, you have some major surprises ahead of you. And this huge audience, it must have been uh, 700 people, burst out into applause. I was one of those that was not applauding because I didn't know what she was talking about. So, uh, But the, the next uh, day or two, I got on the internet and uh, plunged into my study of uh, World Trade Center 7 and the anomalous events of 9-11. Uh, Dr. Ferrer has covered a number of things. I want to emphasize a few other points. And these are our, our study of the uh, both the spheres, but particularly the active thermitic uh, red material that we discovered in the dust from 9-11. This is discussed in our paper in the Open Chemical Physics Journal published in uh, April of 2009. And I would encourage a, a careful reading of this paper. We put a lot of work into this, into this uh, peer-reviewed publication. I'd like to talk first about, of all about the uh, provenience or chain of custody for the samples that we received. I'd like to mention that uh, in this paper we studied four samples in detail, four separate, uh, separately connected dust samples. Um, I received samples from several people, and uh, Dr. Ferrer received samples directly from at least two of these collectors, I think three, three, three of the collectors, okay, uh, separately. So it's not like uh, someone could go to these collectors. I've heard this argument that somehow perhaps um, someone seeded these samples with nanothermite. Well, you know, folks, it's very difficult <laughs> to, to create this stuff. We, I don't know how to make this stuff. Uh, Kevin Ryan, chemist, uh, try, is trying to make this nanothermite, but it's not easy. We do have descriptions from the uh, Livermore National Laboratory in particular of how they fabricated this material. It, but to, to fabricate it is, is not so easy. First of all, the uh, iron oxide grains are uniform. Uh, and approximately 100 nanometers across. That's very tiny, much smaller than a human hair. The aluminum occurs in plates uh, that are about 40 nanometers across. I have no idea how to make those. 
I mean, th this is a high-tech material, and it's embedded in a carbon-rich matrix with, uh, uh, okay, so I've also heard the arg uh, argument that uh, perhaps the falling buildings just generated this nanothermite. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, no. We have, okay, first, as an experimental physicist, I actually took some dust from buildings that were destroyed by controlled demolition. There's a, a bank in Salt Lake City and uh, a hotel in Las Vegas. And so uh, people collected the dust and sent those into our laboratory. We looked in the dust and there were, believe it or not, no red-gray chips, okay? <laughs> it, 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 it relates to the second law of thermodynamics, uh, but I probably won't go into that detailed argument. I'll just say, if you imagine these chips, which are highly active, it's like the ma a match head. And say you have um, the ingredients of a match head in a building. Okay, sulfur, uh, carbon, whatever else they put in the match head. And then the thing falls. And do you, you find little match head ingredients from a building falling? I mean, no. It has to do with, um, in, under chaotic circumstances, things go downhill, not uphill, okay? It's the second law of thermodynamics. I have to talk to students about this, excuse my impatience, but... <laughs> second law of thermodynamics is, uh, it has to do with increasing entropy and uh, disorder, not order. These red-gray materials have very orderly um, sheets containing aluminum, these platelets, and these grains uh, containing the iron oxide, again, are of uniform size, very orderly. And, and furthermore, if it's from a collapsing building, where does all this carbon come from for the matrix? It's just uh, mind-boggling. Um, uh, a colleague of mine asked various nano scientists if, if they thought that uh, a falling building could create this material, which I thought was great because he got them to consider our, our study. But 100% of these uh, nano scientists contacted said no. There's no way that a falling building can create this uh, sophisticated uh, material that, that we report in our paper. Now, back to the chain of custody. <laughs> so it's not just from collapsing buildings. It did come from the dust of the World Trade Center. And as I said, uh, samples were sent separately to Dr. Fair and to myself. These samples all show the same red-gray material. A separate sample was sent to uh, a scientist, Mark Basil, and he, working in New England. And he also sees the same uh, active red-gray thermitic material. I have to say one thing while I'm discussing uh, the efforts by Mark Basil. He was the first one to ignite a red-gray chip and observe the spheres, the tiny uh, iron-rich spheres in the residue after the red-gray chip is ignited. And so I think it's important to give him credit for that observation. Then we looked in our, our uh, residues from the red-gray chips and we also found these spheres. But I'd just like to say that that was found independently and first by uh, Mark Basil. Now, the chain of custody. The earliest collected sample came from uh, Frank D'Alessio. He provided a videotape testimony about how he collected this uh, dust. Uh, Frank D'Alessio was in Manhattan the morning of 9-11. He was present when the towers collapsed. He was over by the Brooklyn Bridge, the Manhattan side. And he reported that the dust was falling and uh, it was collecting on the ground and he picked up a sample and he felt this was significant and so he saved it. He went, he put it in his pocket actually and went over to a friend of his by the name of Tom Breidenbach and they decided to uh, to save this souvenir of the World Trade Center tragedy. And uh, both of their testimonies about this sample are recorded. 
Frank D'Alessio collected the sample about 10 minutes after the collapse of the second tower, the North Tower. He saw the t tower fall, he saw the dust being generated, and he swept up a handful of the dust from a rail on the pedestrian walkway near the end of the uh, Brooklyn Bridge on the Manhattan side. And then uh, this sample was saved and a portion of this was sent to me. I asked all the collectors as they sent me a portion to retain a portion of the World Trade Center dust so that when we have this investigation, which we are demanding, that there will be samples in the hands of the actual collectors that the investigators then can obtain. And they will find the red-gray chips in this material because we've already sampled the other portion. So this sample was collected 10 minutes after the collapse of the tower, long before any cleanup operations began. And therefore, it is impossible for cleanup or steel cutting operations at ground zero uh, to have contaminated these samples. They were collected long before these cleanup operations began. Similarly, the second sample comes from Mr. Stephen White of New York City. It was collected on the morning of September 12th, the day after. And again, this would not be contaminated by cleanup operations, which began later. He found uh, a layer of dust about an inch thick on a stack of folded laundry near a window that had been left open in his apartment. It was clearly, the open window had allowed uh, uh, an amount of dust to enter the room and cover the laundry. He saved some of this dust again. And on February 2nd of 2008, he sent a sample to uh, me for analysis. The third sample was collected from an apartment building on 16 Hudson Street by Mr. Jody Intermont in the afternoon about 2 p.m. on the 12th of September. Two small samples of this dust were simultaneously sent to Dr. Jones, myself, and Kevin Ryan in 2008 on uh, February 2nd. And uh, Mr. Endermont signed an affidavit accompanying each of these samples, verifying that he had personally collected the sample, which was now split. And uh, he gives permission to use his name in conjunction with these samples. So the chain of custody was direct from the collector to the scientist. And a separate sample went to Kevin Ryan. Let me read the signed affidavit by Mr. Intermont. <clears throat> this dust, which came from the collapsed World Trade Center towers, was collected from my loft at the corner of Reed Street and Hudson Street on September 12, 2001. So that was our third sample. 